General Montgomery has paid his first visit to a large factory. He is supremely confident. Britain had been at war for five years. As the D-Day landings approached, Monty set out to make the people believe in victory. Monty is blessed with the human touch of all born military commanders. Why is it? Why is it that today the, the tide has turned and we are beating the Germans and coming towards the final climax of the war? I'll tell you why it is. It's because we've got far the best equipment and we've got far the best men and women too. Far the best. Above all, the troops must have confidence in their new commander. He did what you call in England, bilging a pe people up, what we call the sales picture, giving a guy the needle. And he had a very definite pattern. He would take a brigade group, which was about 5,000 people, in a common in a great big field area, and they would bring a jeep in the center, and he'd get up on what you call the bonnet, what we call the hood, and he'd say, now you fellas all gather around. He said, I want you to, to look at you and see what you're like, and I want you to look at me. And then he would uh, go into this, what we're going to do to the Germans, and how uh, we're going to knock them out of the ballpark and this sort of thing. And it had a great effect. If he was doing a more formal inspection, go down a line, he, were, he didn't look at their boots or anything. Many generals looked at the boots to see if the men had cleaned and polished their boots. I don't think Monty was interested, really, in people's uniform. What he looked at was the bearing of the men's face. And it was a very shaking experience. He looked straight into men's eyes as he went. This left a memory amongst the men that no other general behaved in, in this way. He was, to a certain extent, an actor. And I could see him every now and again putting on an act. But he did it with that purpose, to say, I am a leader, I never lose battles, I don't waste men's lives unnecessarily, and this is it. And he got that across, not only to British troops and Canadian troops, but also to American troops. To see the letters which some of those American troops wrote home before D-Day, when Monty had been to see them and spoken to them, was quite remarkable. He was able to put it over. However, it is quite clear that having put on that mantle, he could never take it off again. And he had become extremely vain. But it was that mantle which he had put on for the war and which was of great value during that period. He had a great position for himself. He'd made a great position for himself in the country. There was, of course, the famous story of when uh, Churchill was alleged to have said to the king, I sometimes think Monty is after my job. And the king said, what a relief. I thought he was after mine. Commanding four allied armies, Monty was leading the largest invasion force in human history. The landings took the Germans by surprise. They had hoped to defeat the Allies on the beaches. Instead, they were overwhelmed by the sheer size and speed of the Anglo-American assault. It was Monty's plan, and it succeeded. Now, Montgomery did insist on one thing, which is a very great thing. He refused to command an invasion with as few troops as had been planned for Overlord in the beginning. He insisted on us having another corps before he would go in, which was exactly right. Uh, we were not. We were supposed to uh, land in uh, on in D-Day with just half the force we finally landed with. And Montgomery refused, and he was able to hold out and get more troops. And that's a very great plus. Monty had ordered the British and Canadians to seize Caen, the capital of Normandy, and to draw in the German army so that the Americans could take Cherbourg and wheel south. The Americans took longer than expected, and in turn blamed Monty for being slow to take Caen. He was very much overcautious, and uh, 
frankly, his, his reputation was made in Africa, and he never lived up to it. He was a commander who never took a chance. Uh, he's sometimes called the master of the set battle. Maybe he was. He was probably very good at it. Uh, but he didn't seem to exploit the opportunities that came his way. Things moved slowly in the British command. Eisenhower, the supreme commander, and his deputy, Air Marshal Tedder, felt that Monty was taking too long to win the battle. Fearing stalemate, they plotted to get Monty sacked, even putting pressure on the prime minister. Churchill agreed to visit Monty in the field, but Monty hated visitors from England and only received him after much delay and under protest. He had to be warm. You can't go on like this. You've got to have these VIP visitors to see. They, they want to come in and see what's happening, and you must have them. I maintained that if you're uh, a great commander-in-chief in the field, commanding great forces, you, you, must, you must have time to think. You must isolate yourself from all the terrific detail of the staff work that goes on. And you cannot see all these rubberneckers, wandering members of parliament and people who come round just because they want to see you. I said, no, I won't have them. The British and Canadians could make little headway without suffering suicidal casualties. But Monty had to keep up the pressure to give the Americans more time. Any officer who failed to perform in battle was dismissed. General Charles Bullen Smith was one. He told me to get hold of Charles, and Charles went in and saw Monty, and Monty said, I'm awfully sorry, Charles, you must go. The men won't fight for you, and you will go home now, get full arrange it all, and you will not go back to the division, and I'm appointing somebody else to take command. Charles came out with tears pouring down his face. It was a terrible moment for him, and of course it broke him for all time. Uh, Monty himself was deeply moved by it. But he said, if I don't remove you, Charles, men will be killed unnecessarily. You must go. That was all. At last, Caen fell. The Americans were now free to launch their delayed offensive to the south. By early August, Monty had won the greatest battle of the war. The Germans lost half a million men and were in full retreat. Monty was cock -a -hoop. At this moment, the Supreme Commander decided to take over field command. Monty had never disguised his contempt for Ike. When you would go into Ike's headquarters and talk to his aides and some of his other people there, they would always have the latest story about uh, Monty's dreadful treatment of Ike on a conference that he failed to show at or a letter that he had sent or something. There was always a Monty story in Ike's headquarters, and each was worse than the other. He'd not been through the mill in war like I had. And I think that it was a pity, really, when he decided to come down from his lofty perch and take command of the land armies after Normandy. Pity. Because he didn't really. It wasn't his métier. Monty seemed to believe that he could be his own man, go his own way, do things on his own terms, and the devil with everything else. And that's really what caused Monty's problems with the rest of the command. Eisenhower had no idea where the Allies should strike into Germany. Time was running out, so Monty now made his own plan to end the war before winter set in. His plan was to encircle the Ruhr by striking north through Holland. To clear the way, Monty would drop three airborne divisions behind enemy lines. They would seize key river crossings and, most important of all, the bridge across the Rhine at Arnhem. He obviously had his eye on the main target, which was the Ruhr. And everybody, I think, agreed that if we were able to knock the Ruhr and stop that producing for the German army, that would have been the end of the war in Europe. At first, the attack went well, but the paratroops were dropped too far from the bridge. They were lightly armed and soon crushed by the German panzers. Monty's plan now looked like folly. It was completely out of character. Uh, one almost might wonder whether it was his plan or whether some cockamamie guy on the staff conceived of it. It was just too bold, too reckless. 
It was Arnhem that put an end to Monty's dreams of finishing the war in 1944, and it was his own fault. He had always guarded against unnecessary casualties and ill-planned ventures. But in his frustration with Eisenhower's inability to make up his mind and go for a single thrust into Germany, Monty had gambled on an airborne drop across the Rhine at Arnhem. It was too little, too late. Monty's defeat rankled, but the Americans were now providing the bulk of all troops and equipment. They insisted there was only one way to win the war, by attacking on all fronts. Monty warned this would leave them too thinly spread. On December the 16th, 1944, the Germans launched a counterattack, with over a thousand tanks and half a million men striking through the Ardennes. The American armies were cut in two. For days, it looked as if the Germans would sweep onto the channel as they had in 1940. 15,000 Americans surrendered. Fearful of German assassination squads, General Bradley, the American commander, shut himself up at his headquarters. He'd lost control of the battle. At last, Eisenhower telephoned Monty for help. Monty told me to get out one of his roses and put a very big Union Jack on the bonnet and with 12 outriders, six in front and six behind, he drove down to take command of the Americans. It was his method of re-establishing morale. It wasn't for the greater glory of Monty, but it was thought to be so by the Americans. 